Contracto Inter-American Development Bank. Um, Dr. Von Braun, you said that your initial remarks that one of the key concerns of IFPRI was the um, policy distortions. And it struck me that in our discussion, not only here today, but in general, we see very little discussion of the degree to which um, agricultural support measures, um, subsidies in the developed countries, uh, trade distortions in developing countries through border tariffs are resulting in huge transfers to the agricultural sector, which in fact encourage production emissions and um, reduce the attractiveness of uh, forestry activities. It seems to me this is a critical question to raise and um, put forward to discussion. <coughs> a second concern I would have is um, about the um, Bill's comments on productivity. The people who, in, in my experience in Latin America where we work, are going to be able to make those kinds of productivity gains are not the poor. Um, they're the larger commercial farmers. The poor don't have access to resources or education or effectively land. So I think um, for them, really, the issue is off-farm employment, getting them out of agriculture, rather than seeing climate change as an opportunity through um, carbon offsets to support some process of adaptation. Thank you. Yes, uh, I think that's a good point, that uh, existing trade distortions, existing price distortions uh, uh, are giving us more emissions now than we need, uh, or than, than we could have. Uh, uh, one of the effects of the high protection for uh, dairy uh, and uh, beef and sheep meat products in North America, Japan, and Europe is to concentrate uh, more of global production uh, in these uh, cold climate uh, uh, places where emissions are very much higher per unit of uh, meat or dairy production than the rest of the world. Free trade in, uh, uh, in uh, livestock products uh, would, would see a contraction of uh, production in some of these cold country, uh, high emissions, cold winter, high emissions in winter uh, regions for agricultural production. Uh, on the point about uh, uh, opportunities in developing countries, well, we've got lots of examples of rapid growth in productivity in developing countries if the uh, uh, inputs uh, made available through uh, um, uh, as public goods to uh, low-income farmers, uh, the huge acceleration of uh, productivity growth in, uh, in, in India in the 60s was in a way the inspiration for the CGIAR system and uh, that's been repeated in quite a few developing countries but it doesn't happen uh, without uh, big uh, uh, public investment in, uh, in research and dissemination of the results of research. I would like to point out that on the trade issues there's a very powerful uh, policy brief from Franz Fischler, the former European Commissioner in the set of briefs, uh, um, which uh, I, I would like to recommend uh, warmly to your reading, uh, with a fairly specific set on how um, the, uh, the new trade regime uh, around climate change need to be reconciled with the existing WTO rules. I, I think you're raising actually a very good point that, you know, within um, countries, who's going to be position to actually take advantage of, of new technologies and new capabilities to improve productivity. I think obviously there's potential there. And I think the, the, the basic point I was trying to make is that um, improving productivity, um, I think both in the agricultural sector but also in the forest sector as well, improving wood utilization, um, I I improving um, kind of fundamental productivity, um, is sort of comparable to energy efficiency on the energy sector. You know, basically, um, it, it, it's a way of getting more out of what you have without having to go into additional lands. I, I think, if anything, about this latest round of discussions on climate have uh, uh, really been interesting to me. It's been the focus for the first time on addressing deforestation, which is 17 to 20 percent of emissions. Um, I think it's, it's impossible to, to have a coherent discussion about this without looking at the drivers. Um, and, and so I, I think this has to be part of the discussion. I think, you know, that the distributional effects of it are going to be important to look at. You know, my sense is that we can get into this and start to think about how this might play out in countries. Um, there's going to be a tailoring of this to meet specific um, uh, uh, specific situations in specific countries. And so
you know, I think even within subsistent agriculture, within kind of lower productivity systems, within less mechanized systems, I think there's going to be a p potential for improvement. Antonio Galloso, I teach at the George Washington University. In recent reports, uh, there is the new factor that some countries like China, Saudi Arabia are leasing hundreds of thousands of hectares of land in developing countries to produce mostly cereals that they will consume directly. This will make not only the equations of who is responsible for the emissions more complicated, but also the issue of monitoring and evaluation, because if China has half a million hectares or a million hectares in Sudan, how do you handle, how do you stimulate or incentivize their following any prescriptions that may be put in place by the negotiations? My question is related to the last two questioners. I wanted to ask if there's a possibility that there's a productivity paradox here where actually uh, increasing agricultural productivity gives an incentive for landowners to deforest sooner and more extensively. And if that is the case in certain places, how do you make certain that productivity doesn't become an incentive to greater global warming and faster climate change? I wanted to uh, uh, address the, uh, as a comment, the previous question, which is essentially that uh, it's going to be necessary to have an integrated approach, and this is precisely why agriculture and agricultural landscapes have to be part of any successful red approach, because otherwise precisely that, you incentivize people to cut down more in order to get productivity gains, but if people have uh, uh, secure tenure arrangements in the forests, if people have a commitment and a responsibility for preservation and conservation that's tied to the productivity gains, then this can be addressed. But we have to stop looking at red as stopping at the forest boundary and start looking at these mixed agricultural landscapes, forests, and other agricultural landscapes as a unitary system or red won't work. I'm Jonathan Haskett, ICRAF. Thank you. Thank you Thank you. My name's Brian Greenberg, and I'm with Interaction. Um, in light of all the things that are going to have to change in order for us to get a grip on this situation, one of the things we need to do is to consider the kind of things that we take for granted as not being changeable in, this, in these scenarios and perhaps find ways to change them. And two in particular that I'm thinking about are our assumptions about population growth, which is something that really can be addressed. It's a cultural issue, but there are ways that we can do a lot better job um, than we have um, and um, for relatively small investment. The second would be dietary changes. Given that about 40% of global grain production goes into the mouths of livestock, um, which then also have enormous secondary implications for greenhouse gases. Does the panel see any way that we can at simultaneously nudge <coughs> cultural changes around diet to reduce pressures on agriculture? I'm Barbara Harris-White. I'm one of the IFPRI trustees. I have one question to Bill and one to Jerry. The question to Bill is one about classification and closure, um, how one classifies agriculture. And if you, um, if you add in the CO2 involved in the production of fertilizers and pesticides and transport that's involved in the production process, and if you add in the CO2 and greenhouse gases in agro-processing, um, is that included in the current estimate or would it change the estimate of the contribution of agriculture to greenhouse gases? And the question to Jerry is, why should agriculture be excluded from um, caps in the trade negotiations? Huh. Um, there was a very interesting description of the background and then a very controversial kind of proposal. And there's a link missing, which I'd very much like you to explain. You basically, I think, asked part of my question, which was when you talk about the contribution of increasing productivity to decreasing uh, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, did you take into a, was that a net figure because, as you pointed out, there are emissions involved in those uh, inputs w which create greater produ agricultural productivity? By the way, you're going to answer the land grabbing question, right? Uh, I can if you want to, but uh, uh, 
I presume you ask why exclude agriculture after we have all on the panel right. said uh, right. uh, part of the problem, part of the solution. You That's exclude it on the problem side? That's why I said it was controversial. Uh, there are a couple of different ex uh, explanations for that point. One of the first one is that if you look historically at how we have uh, treated agriculture in the sort of, if you will, the environmental context, a and as an economist, we, the, the economist would argue that whether you deal with an, an externality by making the polluter pay or by paying the polluter, the outcome is the same except for the difference in resource allocation. In other words, if you pay the polluter, he or she ends up with more money. If you make the polluter pay, he or she ends up with more, less money. But the world ends up in the same place with respect to the externality. There's a lot of qualifications one can make to that statement. But we have tr traditionally dealt with agriculture in the sense of the polluter paying the polluter. So in the United States and Europe and many other places where we actually have active agricultural programs dealing with conservation, we pay farmers, for example, to put in filter strips. And we pay farmers to put in um, um, nutrient management systems and things like that. So from an historical perspective, what I'm arguing is that we should continue that practice for at least a little while. Politically, I think it's going to be very hard to undo that, even if you believe that we should use the polluter plays principles. Politically, it's going to be very hard to undo that in the short run. And the other political argument is that the Europeans have excluded cap agriculture from, their, from cap. It's not that agriculture, agriculture emissions in the EU are counted as part of their ETS, but farmers are not required to, to deal with caps. The U.S. legislation will be the same thing, I think. We're not, going to, we're not going to charge or put a cap on the nitrous oxide emissions or the methane emissions from U.S. farmers as part of the domestic regulation. And so for these reasons, in order to get something done, agriculture is going to have to be on, on the table. It's going to have to be part of the negotiations, dealing both with this historical approach to agriculture in terms of environmental externalities and the politics of the situation leads me to that first statement. But I do recognize that, you know, that's a controversial situation and, I'm, and Bill might have a different view on where we come out on, on that one. I'm going to defer to him on this issue of, of, of measurement of how we, in, in, I've been using the same WRI numbers that you have in terms of how we count uh, agriculture emissions and uh, whether or not the fertilizer production and transport goes under agriculture or goes under something else. But I will say this, the source of those numbers, I believe, is almost entirely from the national submissions uh, to the UNFCCC, which are based in turn on rules that were developed by the IPCC. I've looked closely at the N2O numbers for the, uh, for the IPCC approach. They're basically based on a couple of studies done by a Dutch uh, agronomist, I think, named Lex Bauman. And this is what we would call a number with huge error bars around it. The one, one unit per of, of N2O emission per one per unit of nitrogen application uh, could, I is, any respectable agronomist will tell you for the whole country that just is nonsensical. But that's all countries have to work with. So when we have a number that shows large N2O emissions from agriculture, counting towards a large share of agricultural greenhouse gas emissions, it's with huge air bars around it. Uh, the, the other thing I suppose I should respond to is this issue of um, productivity causing more deforestation rather than less deforestation. Um, the, of course, deforestation is a complicated process and, and deforestation drivers are different in different parts of the world. For example, the reason that um, Indonesia is the third largest emitter of greenhouse gases on a country basis today is not is a very peculiar outcome. It turns out that Indonesia has these l giant peat swamps. And, you know, you think about, I think of, I thought about peat until about a year and a half ago was something that you got, you know, in Northern England and Ireland, you know, and, it, and w Indonesian forests have peat, but, but they do. It has to do with the nature of the soil um, and the, 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 decay, the material that, f the plant material that falls into this swampy water doesn't decay, so it builds up and gets deeper and deeper. And what's happening is that those peat forests then are being converted to palm oil. They're being drained and converted to palm oil so that that peat 
now decomposes and is turned into CO2. Um, and so that's the primary, primary reason why Indonesia is number three. Um, so many different reasons why deforestation takes place. The argument for increasing productivity is that it will reduce pressure on prices. And the argument goes that higher agricultural prices means there's more incentive to cut down trees to grow crops. If you keep the price pressure down by making the existing land more productive, then you reduce pressure to convert that land, convert forest lands to agriculture. The, the first question about um, China and Saudi Arabia um, leasing lands is actually a much larger question, and it gets to fundamentally to how this agreement is going to move forward. There's a principle under the framework convention on climate change of common but differentiated responsibilities, and you know up till now, differentiated has, me has meant that developed countries have a certain level of responsibilities and developing countries are treated en bloc as, as having a, a relatively modest responsibilities for domestic programs if they can and reporting as, as they can. Um, I think the expectations are going to be quite different in this round of negotiations and I think the need to further differentiate within developing countries based on their capabilities and responsibilities, that's going to be central to this discussion. But it's still going to be the case that there are countries that either aren't capable of taking on act, um, serious actions or don't necessarily have these responsibilities. And so the potential for leakage, where emissions basically moved from countries that have responsibilities to countries that don't, is going to be central. And it's not just an issue for agriculture, it's an issue for the energy sector as well. And it's one that's going to have to be de um, dealt with in this agreement and probably in future agreements as, as countries um, evolve and, and, um, and mature, they're gonna, there's going to be a need to take on more responsibilities. And that's one, dealing with the block of countries more comprehensively is one way of getting at this issue. So everyone has responsibilities. Because within the framework convention, another principle is that countries are responsible for their own emissions, the emissions that occur within their borders. And that, that's been a principle up till now. Um, I think with regard to deforestation, um, certainly improving productivity is not the only thing that, that countries could do. There, there's going to be an, a need for countries to take responsibility for their policies, to implement policies that can address land use and land conversion. Um, I think this issue of, of cultural change is really interesting set of questions, population, diet. Um, and I think, again, stepping back and thinking not just about what governments can do, but what um, society can do. Uh, you know, to the extent that these are important issues to deal with and that there are benefits from them, including potentially greenhouse gas benefits, you know, not everything needs to be dealt with by governments in terms of, of, of dealing with some of these. Um, and finally, on the classification system, I, I, I'd agree with Jerry that um, the IPCC is the basis for how we quantify emissions. Um, we are doing a great deal of work to improve our emissions estimation. Um, generally, the way we calculate uh, and attribute emissions is the emissions that are associated with energy use get attributed to the energy sector. And so to the extent that we're counting the energy that goes into fertilizer production or into transport of, of goods and services, that's counted under energy. And the emissions that I'm reporting on with regard to agriculture are the, domestic, are the direct emissions that are associated with agriculture. Yes, I, I found myself uh, thinking that the same answer is the answer to all the questions that have just been raised except for the population one. Uh, if you don't have comprehensive uh, coverage across sectors uh, and across countries, uh, then at the margins you're going to get distortion. Uh, if you uh, uh, tax emissions in China and not in Sudan, then you introduce an incentive for uh, uh, emissions to shift from China to, uh, to Sudan. Uh, if you uh, uh, tax... Uh, 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 um, or if you give some uh, incentive for uh, emissions reduction in agriculture, uh, but don't tax the emissions from forestry, you cr create an, uh, an incentive uh, to reduce uh, uh, the forest areas and increase agricultural production. If you've got a comprehensive regime in which you're systematically putting a price on uh, all uh, uh, emissions and giving a credit for all sequestration, then that all comes out in the wash. Uh, and I think that uh, the, the, the comprehensive uh, 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 carbon uh, pricing could be important even for dietary changes. I've, go I've got a, a, a couple of charts in uh, this review uh, looking at what's happened to Australian 
uh, meat consumption as relative prices have changed over the last 40 years. Uh, uh, poultry and uh, pork became much cheaper relatively uh, and uh, pig meat uh, and uh, sheep meat and uh, cattle meat became much more expensive and there was a huge shift uh, in the uh, uh, I I towards uh, um, consumption of uh, poultry and pig meat and uh, when if we uh, uh, are really going to uh, deal with this issue and on a hoteling curve the price of uh, carbon is rising exponentially from now, it will be $100 or something later in the century, uh, that will actually matter to the price of uh, beef and uh, dairy products and, uh, uh, and sheep meat and, uh, uh, and humans will be uh, choosing uh, t to eat a lot more uh, pork, um, poultry and dare I say it, kangaroo. Uh, but <laughs> Uh, pop uh, population, it's a bit harder because uh, marginal uh, changes like in prices uh, aren't going to be fundamental drivers of, uh, of population. The good, the good news there is that uh, uh, fertility does continue to fall uh, uh, for the world as a whole and most parts of it and uh, we still don't have exceptions to the inexorable association of uh, lower fertility with higher living standards, better education and, uh, uh, and especially education of women. So getting on with uh, a, a productive development agenda uh, seems to be the best way uh, with, uh, for reducing fertility and dealing with population.